Well, welcome back to the Out of Zion podcast and this week's segment on Jews and Christians learning to relate when we are going to hear a fascinating story from another pioneer in this brand new relationship. So please stick with me. Welcome to the Israel Answer series, connecting Israel, the Bible, and you. Join Susan Michael as she explores timely issues and current events from a scriptural perspective to equip the Christian world with a balanced and biblical response. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes, which will ignite your faith and bring the Bible to life in your everyday world. Now, let's join Susan with your Israel Answers. Well, this week we have with us just a fascinating guest and a dear friend, Rabbi Leonid Feldman. He came originally from the former Soviet Union, has a fascinating story to tell, but has been involved in Jewish-Christian relations for really the last, I'd say, almost 40 years. He can clarify that. And uh, has really had a number of experiences that we can learn from, will have wonderful advice for us. And uh, so I want to give a very warm welcome to Rabbi Feldman. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a real honor to have you with us today and uh, to hear from your story and from your experience. You are right now serving as the rabbi at um, the Temple Bethel. Temple Bethel, thank you, there in West Palm Beach. And it's a conservative synagogue. And you were the first rabbi uh, of a conservative synagogue from the former Soviet Union here in America. You have many other first and many uh, wonderful uh, credentials. And I, I will say that you have advanced degrees. Your PhD is in international relations, which I found to be fascinating. So there's so much we look forward to hearing from you. Please share with us just a little bit about your upbringing, your background uh, in the former Soviet Union and what that means to your life story. Okay, so first I think I should begin with a dramatic changes, emotional changes happening to, in my life right now. I am actually retiring after 34 years of being a pulpit rabbi uh, at the end of July. And if that was not enough, which is, you know, bittersweet, a lot of memories and uh, reminiscences, but uh, if that was not enough, a month later, I am actually making Aliyah. I am oh, moving. congratulations, Mazel Tov. <laughs> so my, my daughter made Aliyah a year ago, and she's very happy. She lives in Tel Aviv. And uh, I have been dreaming about this for many years, and I waited for my children to grow up. So uh, I now am ready to go. And of course, it's not easy. I've been in this congregation for many years and people are depressed and emotional and so on. Anyway, but let's go back to, uh, to what you asked about. I do have a strange background. I grew up in a city of Kishinev, which was the capital, which is the capital of a country now called Moldova. It used to be one of the 15 republics in the Soviet Union. And I grew up the typical Soviet child, uh, never heard about Jesus, never heard about Passover, never heard about Hanukkah, never heard about God. I was an atheist. And in fact, uh, later on, I went to university and I studied physics. And as a physics teacher, I was supposed to also learn and teach a subject called scientific atheism. It was my job, basically to prove to Soviet children that there is no God, there cannot be a God, and only mentally sick people believe in God. So that's, that's a very strange background for a rabbi. And um, you mentioned that I am the first conservative rabbi uh, in America from the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, I'm still the only one. And that's very sad to me. But the reason is obvious. They ruined us. For 75 years, the propaganda, anti-God, anti-religion propaganda, the atheist, the atheistic, uh, real brainwashing, brainwashed millions of us. And I'm still trying to find somebody, and I hope to find somebody in Israel, 
Uh, that's basically what I'm planning to do. I'm still not, I'm not going to be on the beach in Tel Aviv. I hope to be able to teach Russian Jews, Ukrainian Jews. We just heard this week, 30,000 Ukrainian Jews just landed in Israel. And the, most of them don't know much about Judaism. Some of them know nothing about Judaism. And some of them have been actually turned off by the ultra-Orthodox establishment in, in, uh, in Israel. So I am, I'm hoping that I can still actually influence the Israeli society. So anyway, so that's my background. And um, I came to, uh, to Israel first. I was a refusenik. I was a dissident, fought, fought for my immigration. Went on now, a explain to our audience what that means, that you were a refusenik. It means you were imprisoned. I was in prison for a short time after my hunger strike, but uh, it, you're correct. And I, I have a podcast now called Ask the Rabbi, and I devoted once one episode, I think it's number three, basically trying to explain to Americans what does it mean to emigrate from a perfect society. We were always told this is workers' paradise. It's the best country in the world. Every morning of my life, I said, death to American imperialism, Israeli Zionism. We live in the most perfect society in, uh, on earth. The future of humanity, glorious communism. Lenin was, Lenin is, Lenin will be forever. And suddenly somebody stands up and says, I don't like it here. I want to go. Of course, it's against everything, their ideology, their philosophy, their educational system. So nobody ever even dreamed about leaving that country. It's a betrayal. But we found a way, Jews, we said, you know what? Ukrainians have a republic, Ukraine. Lithuanians have Lithuania. Kazakh people, they have Kazakhstan. Moldavians have Moldavia. But Jews are homeless. We don't have a place here. And yet there is a country called Israel. And this is how we began this movement and um, we, of course, uh, were very threatening to the society, to the system, and they wanted to suppress it as much as possible. So even when we went through 35 stages, steps of trying to apply for immigration, which the word itself is weird in the Russian language, nobody emigrated there from there back in, you know, in so many years. So even when we finally applied, some of us were refused the exit visa. Most Americans don't understand this concept. Every American get on a, can get on a plane right now, today, and fly to Tokyo or to Australia or to Africa. And the White House is not going to question them. Nobody is going to stop them. Why are you going to Australia? In the Soviet Union, nobody ever leaves the country. I mean, unless you're a party official and uh, famous uh, athlete and so on and so forth. So anyway, they refused some of us and we become, that's a new word, refuseniks. And then when you become a refusenik, you have two choices. Either you become, they tell you, if you sit quiet, you know, get a job as an elevator man maybe. With three PhDs, you don't, you lose everything obviously. You can get a, a job as a, in construction or something. And they say, if you, if you sit quietly, maybe a year from now you can reapply and we will consider your application, which means some people have done it. If you have a wife and three children or two children, you have a lot to lose because they, they can rape your wife and so on. So many people, older people, have chosen that path. I was single. I was young. I said, I have nothing to lose. I hate this country so much. I'm willing to try everything. And you become aggressive, you become active, you sign petitions, you try to, uh, to meet with American tourists and so on. And uh, eventually nothing worked. And I went on a hunger strike, basically saying, I'd rather die than live in this country. And hunger strike. And this was what year? This is 1976. I was 23 years old. And uh, mm. hunger strike is a very, very powerful and threatening tool. That's the only tool, only mm. weapon that we have against them. Because if people, if peasants in Nicaragua or in uh, Venezuela will find out that there are people, people in a communist society are so desperate that they want to die, 
wow, maybe communism is not such a great system. Maybe it's something is wrong there. And this is what I'm trying to use my podcast for. I'm very, very worried about America. I'm worried about where we're moving, what direction we're taking. And I'm worried about the young people today uh, who are attracted to Bernie Sanders and AOC, who are destroying this country that I love so much. They are literally destroying this country. And unfortunately, young people don't know anything about communism. They don't know anything about totalitarian regimes. And they say, hey, if education is going to be free, everything will be free. Why not? So is that best? That's well, my story. Well, we will link to your podcast for anyone that wants to go and listen to more of your story and uh, the things that you're talking about, which I would really recommend they do that. Uh, but let's finish your story. You ended up then in Israel first? Correct. I came to Israel. I spent three years in Jerusalem. I, uh, I was very naive. And I have a one, one episode. Uh, I called it Walking on the Moon. It's literally my first visit to the supermarket. People meet me all over the country and say, I will never forget your story about the supermarket. People who are, you know, I used to give lectures all over the country. It's, a, it's again, for every American who, who is complaining about America. We just discovered that only 38% of Americans are proud to be Americans. This is still the greatest country in the world. And I described my first visit to the supermarket where I walked in, I opened my mouth, and I was frozen. I thought it was the most gorgeous museum I have ever seen in my life. And I spent three hours totally confused about all these varieties and so on. Anyway, I spent three years in Jerusalem. I went to the army. I went to, I got a master's degree on Mount Scopus at Hebrew University. And then I was, I uh, got an amazing job. I was sent to Italy to work with Russian refugees who left the Soviet Union, but chose not to come to Israel. They chose to come, go to America or Canada or Australia. And my job was not to convince them to come to Israel. My job was to prepare them for the free world. After three years in Israel, I knew what a bank was. I knew what a microwave was. I knew what deodorant was. I knew what toilet paper was. You see, this is another thing that Americans do not understand. It was a third world country, third world country with atom bombs. That's it. It was a primitive society, worse than m most African countries. So uh, I had to teach these refugees basic things. What's a checking book? What's a bank? What's uh, insurance? What's real estate? And, and so on. And I was also teaching Judaism and Zionism in particular. I was a, not religious, but I was a Zionist, clearly. So I was trying to teach them a little bit about Jewish history, Zionism, and so on. And then I, I came to America to get a PhD at Columbia University because I had met a, a famous professor in Jerusalem and um, I couldn't afford uh, to go to Columbia University. They asked me if I had $67,000 a year uh, to become a foreign student and I never heard about that kind of money. I had, after three years in Israel, I thought I was rich. I had close to $4,000 in savings. And suddenly they said, no, we, we cannot give you a visa as a student uh, unless you show that you have enough money. That leads me to another crazy story. I went to a, a lawyer, immigration lawyer, said, how can I get a, you know, a green card so I can work? And she said, well, you have to work in a house. It's called domestic field. And so I became a butler. So my first job in the free world, in, the, in America, I became a butler in uh, Westchester, New York. Uh, so with two master's degrees, I learned how to serve four cups and four glasses and four forks and four knives. And I used to wear a uniform and I used to say, breakfast is served, ma'am. Anyway, that was my job. And, well, uh, one you thing have I to draw the connection for us now. How did you become religious and become a rabbi? So, okay, so this is it. Uh, I had one address, one, one American that I had met in Israel, and I decided to write to him. Maybe he remembers me, and he says, this is ridiculous. He responded to me. He says, this is ridiculous. You should not be a butler. You have gifts. You have talents. 
send me your resume, you should come to, and he was in Los Angeles. Anyway, so he showed my resume to a few people and I got uh, four different jobs. I was making $200 in one Hebrew school and $300 at the Jewish Federation. And it was very basic. Anyway, and then when I was just applying for these four jobs, two of the people, principals of the Hebrew schools, asked me a strange question. Do you know Dennis Prager or Joseph Telushkin? Do you know those names? And I said, no, I just arrived in America. And they said, you should meet them. You have a lot in common. I think you will enjoy meeting each other. Anyway, so somebody introduced us and that changed my life. Um, Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin became my close friends until today. And uh, I read a book that they wrote at the age of 26. The nine questions people ask about Judaism. It changed my life. And uh, six months later, I was already a student in the rabbinical program at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where I eventually was ordained six years later. And that's my story. Well, it's, it's fascinating. And there's one more uh, aspect to this, if I remember right. Uh, you did not have your bar mitzvah until uh, later in life, is that right? It is correct. Nobody had a bar mitzvah but mitzvah in the Soviet Union. I never heard about bar mitzvah. I never knew that there are people called rabbis. I did not know there were synagogues. Again, this is something that Americans cannot understand. The average Christian, the average Christian, I'm not talking about people like you. You're very knowledgeable about Judaism. The average Christian knows much more about Judaism and Jewish history than I knew as a physics teacher at the age of 23. Anyway, so of course I'd never had a bar mitzvah and I became a rabbi and usually you have a bar mitzvah and then you become a rabbi. <laughs> but at some point in this synagogue where I'm still for another month, another three weeks, Temple Bethel, the two co-presidents approached me and said, we understand you never had a bar mitzvah. We would like to give you a real bar mitzvah, not a fake one, oh. not a kind of bar mitzvah, a real bar mitzvah. We will invite your family, your friends from all over, and, uh, and you will have your bar mitzvah. So at the age of 60, I had a bar mitzvah. We had 500 people there from all over the world, including my sister, my children were sitting there. Uh, my former wife was sitting there. I was divorced by that time. Anyway, which uh, people still can, can watch my speech on YouTube. It's the bar, you know, Rabbi Feldman's bar mitzvah. And uh, the funniest line people find in that speech is when I said, well, this is not a typical bar mitzvah. I mean, how many of you have been to a bar mitzvah where an ex-wife is sitting there? <laughs> she loved that line. She loved it. We're still good friends, of course. So uh, anyway, so yes, it was quite an interesting event. Such an amazing story. And now I, I realize that you had just become a rabbi and probably just come to Florida when immediately you started to engage in Jewish Christian relations. Is Correct. that right? So I arrived in, in Florida a year after I was ordained. And uh, for that year before I arrived here, I was lecturing and I was teaching for two separate Jewish organizations. So I was all over the country, literally. That's how I made a living. And uh, I guess some people heard me speak and, uh, and followed my, my career and so on. So when I arrived in Florida, somebody came to the temple. Originally, I was a temple Emmanuel on the island of Palm Beach. And somebody came over to me, a Christian person, and said, you know, I, I saw you on on the television and something, and somehow this began the connection. So I was uh, invited to speak in a church, and, um, and then another church, and then eventually a very important person, Faye Hardin, I'm sure you know her. Faye Hardin started a television program here in West Palm Beach. She came to my temple one day and she says, I'd like to interview you on my show. I have something like 150, 200,000 people watching it every week. And so, uh, so the question I think that a lot of people are wondering about is, why me? 
Why is it that most rabbis would never have accepted an invitation like this, would not be on a Christian television channel? Why was I so comfortable with uh, Christian people and specifically evangelical Christians? Why was I interested in interfaith dialogue? And the reason I think there are several reasons. One of them is that because I did not grow up um, with religion, I did not grow up with Christians, so I did not know that somehow there is a barrier between Jews and Christians. So when I came, and the same about racism. I never understood racism. I still don't understand racism. I never saw a black person in my life. So anyway, so I never met a Christian. So I was very open to this idea. And then, because I'm so sensitive to anti-Semitism, growing up in the Soviet Union, I was beaten up, I was called names, I, I knew I at the age of nine I would never become a journalist, I would never become a principal of a high school, I would never become a director of a factory and so on. You know, as a Jew, as a Feldman, your, your career is very limited. Anyway, so when I was so sensitive to anti-Semitism and then I discovered that there is a group of people who love Israel, who are always standing up for Israel, who, do, who are not anti-Zionist, who say the opposite, I looked around and I said, wow, we don't have too many friends, so we should reach out to the Christian, evangelical Christians. And of course, it was in the beginning very dangerous and very problematic and very controversial. When I began to be, to be also Faye Hardin invited me for an interview for about 45 minutes or so. Then she called me back a, a week later. She says, so many people called back and said, we want to bring you back. And eventually I basically took over the show. She was sitting next to me. She would ask a question and I would teach Torah, basically. I would be wearing my prayer shawl and teach stories, Noah and Moses and David, and people loved it. Uh, you would run into a, a Jewish woman at uh, in a supermarket and she would say, excuse me, you're that rabbi that I saw on television. I was switching channels at two o'clock in the morning, couldn't fall asleep, and suddenly I saw you. I said, okay, and I never knew all these stories. I never understood Abraham. I never understood Rachel. Wow, I'm learning a lot from you. Anyway, so that kind of led one thing to another one. I uh, was approached by local Christian leaders and uh, Mario Bramnik, Pastor Bramnik, is a very dear friend. He invited me to speak in his church on a regular basis. Then I brought his congregation to my temple. Anyway, but at, this, at the beginning, it was very controversial. There was a newspaper article, a Jewish newspaper article, front page, with my picture there, speaking with a cross behind me, and really angry aggressive, attacking me, that, uh, you know, he's naive. What is Rabbi Feldman doing? They are dangerous people. They don't belong in, they don't believe in abortion. And they, they, they want to convert us to Jesus and, and, and so on and so forth. That was beginning of controversy. And uh, thank God I was very successful at that time. I was at Temple Emmanuel, which became one of the most prominent synagogues in America. We had five, six hundred people every Friday night, standing room only. So my board and my president was very supportive. They were proud. They did not have a problem. And I obviously was teaching. I was explaining to them, wake up, wake up. So what? We don't agree on everything. Of course we don't. But do you agree with your spouse on everything? Do you agree with your family on everything? So what? But we cannot pick and choose. We have wonderful people who love us, who want to embrace us, who fight for Israel. And slowly, slowly, more and more people quietly would come to me and say, I'm with you. I understand what you're saying. And to be honest, I, and on this channel, <laughs> I'm not scared to say that, we politically also aligned very much. I suddenly realized that my people are far to the left of me. They don't get it. They don't understand the uniqueness of America. They don't understand how to vote. And they still don't. They still don't. Even three years ago, I got into trouble. Palm Beach Post had a front page article about me that got me into trouble. I lost five 
congregants as a result, including a Supreme Court justice who was a member of my congregation. Lois Frankel, who is a U.S. Congresswoman, did not step down because of that, but five other people did. Anyway, so unfortunately, we're not there yet, but more and more Jewish people are waking up and understanding that you and I have much more in common than the things that separate us. I did have one more thing with uh, Faye Hardin, for which I'm very, very grateful to her. She called me up one day and she says, I want you to come with us to Africa, to Kenya, and you will be addressing 400, uh, maybe 500 pastors from all over Central Africa will go to Kenya. And uh, afterwards, you and I will fly with a crew to Israel because this was in the middle of Intifada, which I hope most of your people remember. It was a horrible time in Israel where almost every day there was another bus, another bus, another coffee shop, another pizza place exploding and so on. So uh, I went to, uh, to Kenya. I spent two days at this amazing convention. I saw some pastors without shoes. It was an amazing experience outside of Nairobi. And then she and I flew to Israel and we traveled all over Israel and I was interviewing people in Hebrew and um, with a crew and she made a, a show, a movie. I think it was two part, maybe three part show. I still have it somewhere, I have the tape. And it was basically explaining to American people what Israel was going through, what Intifada, horrendous, horrendous time when people would kiss their child in the morning, not knowing if they would see them later on. That's what it was. Anyway, so, so eventually I lost that show and my relationship with my president was getting worse and worse and eventually I just left. Well, um, you've touched on so many different uh, issues here, and I'll, I'll just take a minute to say that I have done a series of three articles to go alongside this series of interviews that I'm doing. And the first two articles surveyed the history of Jewish Christian relations, but the third one I recommend to our audience to read because I touch on some of these issues that Rabbi Feldman has brought up that uh, they are things that we have to overcome, but they can be overcome, but we have to be aware of them and be careful and uh, be cautious, and, but know how to articulate on some of these things. And one of them today is this political divide. Uh, there is such an extreme division now between the right and the left. It used to not be so uh, strong. But now it's so strong that it actually has the potential of um, interfering with Jewish-Christian relations because most of the Jewish community, say two-thirds of the Jewish community is on the left and most of the Christian community is on the right. So it, it is something that we have to overcome in these days. But Rabbi, I want to ask you, since you got involved in the 80s in Jewish-Christian relations and you really paid the price for being involved in it, you were attacked and you were, you know, maligned over it. Um, but how have you seen it change between the 80s and between today? We're talking about 35 years. Uh, are you hopeful? Am I optimistic? I do see differences. I do see changes. So, yes, I actually suffered. One of the reasons that I left that amazing congregation that we had, Temple Emmanuel on Palm Beach, is that the board has changed and the president, new president, did not like me, did not like that I was very independent, I was very influential. And he basically came over to me one day and said, the board wants you to stop those TV shows. So after two years of teaching hundreds of thousands of people, Jews and Christians, about teaching Torah, I stopped. So things are changing. I think people are beginning to see. And also anti-Semitism on campuses, I think, also. Our kids are being brainwashed and they say, why is my professor saying these things? Israel is apartheid? And we have Democrats on the, war, on the floor of the United States Congress using that word? Tlaib went out of her way five times 
the apartheid state, the apartheid state, before there was any, any investigation about the journalists from mm -hmm. Al Jazeera. So our kids are going to see something is wrong here. And I hope that they will look around saying, who is with us? Well, Rabbi, our audience is mainly evangelical Christians that are listening. We may have a few guests uh, that are otherwise, but what would be your advice to us? Uh, some of our audience, they, they are not involved in Jewish Christian relations, but they love the Jewish people and they'd love to be involved with their local Jewish community. Uh, this is something they just, they get excited about. What's your advice to them? That's a very important question. My advice would be to learn, first of all, about the history of their relationship. When I met you, I was so impressed. You were, you were so knowledgeable. You, you knew the barriers between the Jews and the Christians, and that's why history is so important. That's why history for American kids, they're teaching them that America is evil. America is not perfect, but it's not evil which country is better than ours, and so on. Anyway, history is the key. They have to understand it. And major Jewish, major, major Christian leaders, including the popes, have apologized to the Jewish people for hundreds of years of persecution and pogroms and inquisition and so on and so forth. That's the first thing. They have to understand where a Jew meets an evangelical Christian, there is this obstacle, like fear a little bit. And the second thing is what I'm trying to explain in one of my podcast episodes. Can we really trust evangelicals? And I explain why um, that you do not have an agenda. I mean, secret agenda to convert everybody. And in fact, if you do, I say to people, so what? Wake up. <laughs> Let them have this agenda. They hope that we, when we all make, to, make Aliyah, move to Israel, Jesus will show up. Great. I will be the first one to welcome you. Big deal. Why, why do you care? When, when, when your husband brings you flowers, do you say, I wonder, I wonder why? Why do you have an agenda over there? Let him keep bringing flowers. Shut up already about the agenda and stuff. This is the stupidity, in, and, and especially for Jews, because Judaism does not really care as much as perhaps Christianity, what's in your heart? We say, I don't know what's in your heart. I want to witness, I want to watch your actions. How do you behave is much more important than what your motivation is. Well, we will link to your episode number 20 for sure so that uh, our listeners can listen uh, to that and also sign up to subscribe to your podcast. I think it's uh, fascinating. Will you be continuing your podcast once you Correct. go to Israel? Okay, yes. excellent. Then we, we want to stay in touch with you and we just wish you all the best. We pray God's blessings on you as you make this major transition, but such an exciting one to Israel. And I know that he's going to open doors for you and use you with all of these Ukrainian uh, refugees and new immigrants from Russia. So we expect the very best, but we pray God's best, absolute best for you, Rabbi. We thank want to you. thank you for taking time to be with us today and sharing your story. It's uh, fascinating. We've learned so much. So uh, with that, I want to bid everyone adieu. Be back here next week. And um, until then, God bless. And God bless you, Susan. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Out of Zion with Susan Michael. Be sure to subscribe to Out of Zion now on Apple Podcasts, cpnshows.com, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen and learn. Out of Zion with Susan Michael is a production of ICEJ USA, all rights reserved.